Um, so my name is Shamichael Hallman. Uh, I'm from Memphis, Tennessee. Yeah. Shirts got Memphis, represent Memphis. Uh, for about the last 15 years, I have been involved in ministry in some type of capacity, volunteer full-time, uh, in many, many ways. And um, I do that because, number one, I just feel this incredible um, kind of burden or call um, to serve in ministry. Um, I believe that the local church is the hope of the world. I really believe that the local church, living Jesus, teaching Jesus, reaching others through Jesus, um, has the capacity to change our world completely. And so for the last five years, um, like Angelo, like others, um, I have really put a lot of thought into how technology um, might change the way we approach things in the church, how we might deal with opportunities and issues within the church and how we might deal with things outside of the church, right? And there are a number of opportunities, a number of issues within the church. We think about how do we advance the gospel um, in areas uh, within the U.S. that are becoming increasingly hostile to the gospel, um, but also places abroad where the gospel's never been shared. How might we use and leverage technology for that? Um, areas such as spiritual formation, when we think about what it takes in, in those kind of spiritual disciplines of prayer and scripture reading. Um, right? I saw this, uh, Lifeway did some, some, some research recently um, where it says only 11% of people have actually read the entire Bible. 11% of Christians, only 11% have, have, have engaged with most of the Bible, right? And we know that the Word of God is an inexhaustible resource, right? I mean, there's so much there. And so how might we use technology to, 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 to expand the number of people who are actively engaged with the entire Word of God, right? We also think about connection. Um, we have all of these resources now that should bring us closer, that should bring us more together, but more and more research is showing that people are feeling even more lonely, more isolated, right? So how might we use technology to reverse that trend? Um, and even church attendance. Um, uh, you think we, we look at numbers now where people used to perhaps come to church every Sunday, and now maybe it's the first Sunday or a couple of Sundays, depending on how their life goes. So again, what are the opportunities there? Right. Outside of the church, uh, um, how do we engage people to leave the, the walls and go tackle issues of isolation and racism and division, uh, social justice, uh, the education gap, uh, mass incarceration, crime, uh, poverty, homelessness, right? Um, for the last three months, I've done a deep dive in homelessness, and it has been really just amazing what uh, I've learned and the way that uh, even some some preconceived notions that I had have, have been kind of shattered, man. Um, you know, we tend to think of homelessness as, at least in the South anyway, I'm, I don't, we're on the West now, but, you know, those people are lazy, uh, they don't want to do any work, right? And I'm learning that that is just so far from the truth in most cases that you have individuals who are battling some type of substance abuse, right, uh, alcohol or heroin or meth, you have a group of people who are wrestling with various mental issues, bipolar and schizophrenia. You have service uh, uh, veterans who are dealing with PTSD. I mean, you know, just seeing all types of things and this messed them up and they just haven't been able to recover. And so how might we use the gospel? How might we use technology to do that? And we know in the church we have the answer. It's all of us. Right. It's, it's everyone who comes in the building each and every Sunday uh, uh, who has been gifted, who has been shaped, who has been uh, 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 touched by God in a way to deal with that issue. Right. But there's a problem. Right. The, the problem in most churches is that only about 20 to 30 percent of the people in the church are actively engaged. Uh, the number actually sits around 27 percent of people who are coming in your church and my church are actually doing anything. 
So I begin to ask myself, like, man, what's, what's going on? What's happening with, with, that, with that 70% of people who are just sitting on the sidelines? Like, like how, how could we begin to engage them? What, what's their current mindset? What's currently happening where they're just sitting on the sidelines? And so I've spent time putting these people in, in kind of various buckets, right? I, I think there's a group of people who uh, are still trying to figure it out, still trying to figure out. Uh, 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 what it means to be Christian, what it means to serve Jesus, right? There's another bucket of people who who simply decide, you know, I'm just not going to do anything. Like, I'm just, that's just, hey, you got it, brother. You you go deal with the truth. I'm just going to sit over here and listen to the pastor, listen to the worship, and when it's all with, I'm going to go home, and I'll see y'all again next Sunday. I have not decided to do anything, right? There's another group of people, man, who I think, and, and I think this is a larger group than we recognize, a group of people who are just sitting on the sidelines waiting to be engaged in the right way. Waiting for someone to speak to that burning desire, that burning passion that they have. Um, and, and, and I think the church, this is a huge opportunity for us. Because you think about most of the uh, volunteer opportunities in our church are personality driven. Right. The pastor's got to get up there and kind of come on, y'all, let's go serve Jesus. Right. They're often tied to the needs of the church. Right? We need somebody to watch the children. We need somebody to be in the parking lot. We need somebody to clean this place up when we're all done. Right? Um, and so I had struggled for a long time to figure out, man, what? Man, there has to be another way to engage people. And in 2013, I heard about an event called Code for the Kingdom. Some of you have probably heard from it. It is a Christian hackathon started by a group in Dallas. Um. And, and it was an amazing event. So they had the first event, 2013, in San Francisco. And they pulled about 100 people together. It was about 100, actually about 120 people. Uh, people who were creatives, people who were entrepreneurs, people who just served in churches. And said, hey, we've got, uh, what, what would it be like if we were to take what you do on your day job and apply that. What would, it, what would it look like for us to take your skills as a developer, your skills as a graphic designer, uh, your skills as an app developer, and tackle issues in our world? So we had about eight buckets of social justice, of poverty, of human trafficking, of scripture engagement, of gospel advancement. And what I saw, what I saw over that weekend were people who, 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 who had already worked 40, 50 hours on their job come to an event and, and give another 50 hours, <laughs> another 52 hours. They basically gave, gave, basically gave their entire weekend to work on something that was deeply passionate. I said, man, that's church, we're missing something. Because in the church, you would struggle to get a person to, to, to volunteer for a couple of hours a week. But in this event, people were staying for 50, people, people were bringing sleeping bags. <laughs> I'll sleep over here for a couple hours and I'm going to get back up and work on this thing. And it was amazing to me. And I think from that, uh, um, the church could learn a lot of things, right? Now, there were some pretty amazing technologies that have come out of this. Since that time, uh, this movement has engaged over 3,000 people. There have been hackathons all across the world uh, through this movement. And there's some really, really cool things that have happened. Uh, I remember one, one app that I saw was called Ceaseless. This app was designed to help every person pray for three Facebook friends every day. And they had this audacious goal to pray for everybody on the planet in five years. Just this one guy just had a random idea, and people gathered around him to help him build it. He was very close to making it happen. Uh, there was a social media campaign called I Have a Name, uh, and, and, and it, it was tied to human trafficking. Uh, how, how the campaign worked was they, they went after the hashtags that were being used by human traffickers in certain cities. And they essentially bombed those hashtags. So let's, go, what, what's ha what, let's, let's look at the human trafficking that's happening in, in Houston or happening in San Francisco. What are those hashtags? And then let's find those hashtags and then let's use those hashtags to, to, to tell a different story, to show uh, a man who, who, who was accepted responsibility to be a father, um, uh, to, to show a young girl who, who, who's, who's someone's daughter, right, um, to, to disrupt what we were seeing in human trafficking. Um, there was an app called Lightweave. Uh, which was a visual interface, a different way to engage with deep theological concepts in the Bible. 
And again, these are ideas uh, for people who were sitting in church. And here's the thing that I learned. Most of the individuals who were coming to these events, and it's been about 100, 150 at each one. Most of the people who were coming to the events have been unengaged by the church. They, they're coming to church and sitting on the back row. And if, any, if, if they had been asked in any way, generally the ask was, hey, will you come work on our website? <laughs> right? <laughs> will you come help retool our website? And so you had all of this creative capacity. You have all of this ingeniousness, right? People who are just waiting to do things and just have not been spoken to in the right way. And so here's where I am now. I'm at a place now where I'm trying to convince the church. I'm trying to convince church leadership. I'm trying to convince nonprofit organizations that you've got to change the way in which you go after volunteers. Yes, I know you, there are certain needs that have to be met. You've got to have somebody in ch- children's. You've got to have somebody in youth. Like, I understand that. And I'm not, I'm not saying do away with that. But I'm saying create a new crop of opportunities. Create a new crop of opportunities that fit in a couple of buckets. Number one, that speak to people's passions and their gifts. Right? As believers, we know this. We know that all of us have been shaped. All of us have been, have been purposed. All of us have been given certain spiritual gifts to, 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 to edify the church, right? To, uh, to, to ensure the gospel goes forward. And we too, we as, 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 as spiritual leaders ought to create opportunities and create spaces where people can begin to thrive in those areas. Now most, now most pastors won't do this because it scares them. Because they think that, hey, if I do this, my children is going to be empty on Sunday. But what I have discovered is that if you'll get a, if, if, you'll, if you'll find all the people in your church who are passionate about a particular area and, and, and you just give them space, they'll figure it out. You don't have to give them a, a fancy job description. You don't have to give them any type of stuff. They will figure it out. They'll find a way to use their passions to, to not only solve what's happening in your church, but also take care of what's happening in your community. The second thing is that, is, is that we have to provide cause-driven opportunities. The people are looking for a way to know that their life makes a difference. And so even the stuff inside the church, we've got to tie that to a bigger cause. We've got to tie that to a bigger narrative. Yes, you're just, yes, you're on the parking lot and you're greeting people, but guess what? There's something else that you're doing. Uh, your work is, 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 is amazing. Your work is changing people's hearts even before they get inside the building. You're not just a greeter on the parking lot. You, 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 you're a heart opener up, right? And so we've got to begin to do those things. Now, again, I know that this stuff is common sense, right? This stuff, this, this, this is stuff that we all know. This is stuff that, hey, just, hey, of course we should do stuff that's, that's passion driven. Of course we should do stuff that's, that's, that, that plays to people's skills. But it's not happening. In most churches, it's simply not happening. And so we've got to begin to have a new conversation. We've got to begin to kind of uh, 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 have conversation around what might that look like. How might we take principles that we've learned from Code for the Kingdom that's mobilized thousands of people in just a few short years and cranked out all types of applications in just a few short years. How might we take that and apply that in the church where perhaps we see 60 or 70 percent of people now who were, sitting, who were once sitting on the sidelines are now actively involved, actively engaged, actively using their skills, their passions, their talents to be life transformers. Thank you. We Mass Media, media empowering community.